to have you. We're going to start um, in a few minutes, just uh, making sure everybody is here. I guess everybody knows how Zoom works. Je pense que tout le monde sait déjà comment fonctionne le Zoom, mais je voudrais vous inviter à um, utiliser uh, en bas à droite le petit globe terrestre qui vous permet de, de choisir votre interprétation en français ou en anglais. I'd like to invite you to the right-hand side where you, there is a little uh, globe for interpretation and you could choose English or French and uh, because we will probably be able to speak in both languages, so don't hesitate. Et, et nous inviterons bien sûr tous ceux et celles qui parlent français à, à s'exprimer en français s'ils le souhaitent, puisque nous avons la chance d'avoir l'interprétation. Um, I'd like to invite you also to use the chat to say hello, and I see hello to, uh, hello, Patron from Zimbabwe. We also have uh, uh, Humphreys from uh, Malawi. So thank you very much to be here. Hello, uh, Narkis from Tajikistan. Uh, Nargis, sorry. Very happy to have you. On est très ravis de vous avoir. Pour l'instant, je ne vois que des... Um... Ah, voilà. Uh, je ne vois que des, um, des anglophones qui parlent. I only see uh, English-speaking people saying hello. J'espère que quelques francophones sont aussi présents. Et donc, je vous rappelle que vous pouvez utiliser l'interprétation en bas à droite uh, pour uh, l'intégralité de, de la présentation. And I'd like to remind you, you can use interpretation in, uh, uh, on the bottom right. Uh, bonjour, Oscar. Bonjour. Hello. People from Malawi. We have uh, people from Tanzania, from Guinea. On a des personnes de, de tous ces pays. Nous sommes ravis de vous avoir. Nous allons commencer dans quelques minutes. Nous sommes déjà une 70. We're already 70 people. Hello. Um, wow. People from DRC. People from... Um, which country? Indonesia, yes, hello Indonesia. Welcome for uh, beaucoup de personnes de l'Indonésie. Ravi de vous avoir. Uh, we're really happy to have you. We will be starting in a few minutes. On va commencer très bientôt. Um, and I'm uh, really happy that uh, you're on time. Vraiment heureux de, de vous voir uh, à l'heure. In a few minutes, I will, in one or two minutes, I will start um, just to remind you a few things about how Zoom functions and I give you And then I will give the floor to my colleague to, to welcome you. Donc, dans quelques minutes, je vais présenter uh, uh, Zoom et les différentes fonctionnalités pour être sûr que tout le monde s'y retrouve. Et ensuite, on va, uh, on va pouvoir commencer uh, la présentation uh, dans quelques minutes. Hello, everyone. Greetings from Zambia, from Ethiopia, from Côte d'Ivoire, from Zambia here, from UNICEF, from Tanzania. Really happy to see everyone. We are 89 people, 89 personnes déjà, à 8 heures, heure uh, de Washington. It's 8 a.m. Uh, Washington DC time. Uh, for those in Africa, it's probably afternoon. From those in e Asia, it's probably evening. Hein? Donc certains, c'est uh, l'après-midi, d'autres, c'est le soir. Encore quelques minutes, le temps qu'une qu petite centaine de personnes... De... I'm muffled. On me dit que je suis muffled, um, que je suis... Uh, bon, on ne m'entend pas très bien. C'est ça Je vais euh, voir si je peux améliorer ça. Mais j'aurai euh, l'autre problème. So just give me a second. Greetings from... OK. Donc, je vais juste rappeler que euh, pour ceux qui les francophones, d'utiliser en bas à droite l'interprétation qui vous permet d'accéder au français. And I'd like to remind the, everyone that you can have access to interpretation Uh, on the bottom right, there's a little globe for those who don't know, and you can have access to interpretation. Voilà. Shall we start? Uh, we are uh, already 100 people. Um, I'm going to, to take the floor for a few minutes just to present some technicalities. Voila. Are you seeing my screen properly? Can you see my screen? Perfectly. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Pascal Kildebert from the um, GFF Knowledge and Learning team. I just want to give you a few technical uh, uh, elements about uh, the Zoom features. Just to remind you that you can rename yourself. Uh, please do not hesitate to add your country and your name. It's always good for us to know who is here, which countries are present. It's really a, a pleasure to see all this diversity of countries. 
Um, I'd like to insist again, for those who don't know, that we can also have access to interpretation. You can select your language on the bottom right, uh, where it's written interpretation. Et donc, je le dis juste en français pour ceux qui viennent peut-être d'arriver. Um, vous pouvez choisir l'interprétation en bas à droite. Um, for those who are not familiar with using Zoom, you can choose either the gallery view or the speaker view. Um, so sometimes we, we could invite you just to, to open your cameras, to say hello, to see all the faces. It's always a pleasure to see everyone joining. Um, we will be using the chat. Um, so do not hesitate to ask your questions in French or English in the chat. It will be uh, a pleasure for us to, to answer. And uh, if that's okay with you, I will uh, give the floor to um, Sanam Roder de Wan, um, who is going to open and welcome you all to this presentation. Sanam. Thank you, Pascal. I'm just watching the numbers of participants grow. <laughs> it's really wonderful, as you said, to see so many people um, from all over the world uh, joining us. So welcome. My name is Sanam Roder de Wan. I'm a senior health specialist. Um, on the service delivery innovation team. So I lead our portfolio on service delivery redesign um, with Mickey Chopra and am um, delighted to be chairing this session with you, um, co-hosting it with our colleagues uh, at GFF. This topic um, I think is of growing interest around the world. Service delivery redesign um, is, is I think in many people's minds still um, a question mark. What is what do we mean by service delivery re redesign? Um, what does it mean to uh, to translate the ideas behind service re uh, redesign into our programs at the World Bank and with our countries? Um, so this is really a chance for us to learn. Um, we're delighted to have uh, Professor Margaret Crook with us, who will walk us through um, the concept, who will share with us some of her um, learnings and work in, in, in piloting redesign in Kenya. We have a great panel ahead of us uh, with a variety of perspectives um, on redesign, especially um, uh, around implementation of redesign. And then we're really hoping to save time at the end for, uh, for question and answers. So as Pascal said, please um, you know, keep yourself on mute uh, to save bandwidth unless you're speaking. Um, you can turn your camera off. Uh, you please put your questions in the chat box, even as we're going along. We'll have a moment sort of after Margaret speaks to, um, to ask some clarifying questions. And then by the end, hopefully some time to really get into the meat of things. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to um, invite our practice manager from the GFF, Monique Fletter, to, to welcome us and get us started. Over to you, Monique, thank you. Great, thank you so much, Sanam, and so great to see uh, so much interest in this uh, seminar. And uh, Mohamed Pate, our combined GFF director, HMP director, would have really liked to be here this morning. He sends his regards. Um, fortunately, he had a, a conflict. Um, this is there's no there's no um, this is such an important moment to have this conversation. And when we look at what happened. Uh, um, when COVID happened last year, um, the initial response of the world obviously was very much focused on the pandemic itself. And very quickly, we started to see in our partner countries an incredible impact on the ability of women to access um, uh, the quality health services. Um, and in some countries, this, this decline or disruption was up to 25% uh, uh, disruption. And so a really huge impact um, of COVID on, the, on, on these quality services. And um, so we're, we're just so delighted to have Margaret here. Um, she co-chaired the, uh, uh, the panel, the Lancet Commission on Quality Health Systems. Um, and we see this really as a great opportunity uh, to um, think about in this moment in time, are there things that we can do collectively uh, to not just build back, but build back better. And so that's the opportunity we have. And um, it, I'm really looking forward to hearing from all over the world what you are experiencing and how you see um, this going forward and what our joint opportunity is. Um, to really make some significant changes in the way we approach service delivery. Uh, so with that, I'll hand it back to you, Sanam or Margaret, um, and I look forward to uh, participating in this seminar. Thank you. Thank you, Monique. 
Margaret, I think we're ready for you. Welcome. Thank you so, thank you so much, Sanam. And thank you, Monique. Thank you, Pascal. And, and what a great pleasure to see so many of you, uh, your names and some faces. And in fact, faces of friends and colleagues uh, uh, also that uh, I have met on my many travels throughout the country. So really delighted to be here. And let me jump right in. I want to save maximum time for discussion today. So um, let me share my screen if that's okay. Let's see here. I think, yes, perfect. One second. All right. Okay, so uh, as um, Monique and Sanam uh, uh, mentioned, we are here to talk about um, service delivery redesign. But before we get into what does that term mean, how do we think about it, how, does, how do we implement it, I wanna start with a very simple premise, which is that the first imperative of health systems is to save lives. And I would uh, propose that if health systems aren't doing that today, they need to be rearranged to do so. They need to be redesigned to do so. It seems to be uh, an unquestionable uh, goal. I think very few people would argue. But as I will show, we have fallen into, uh, into patterns and path dependencies in health systems, which no longer serve our women and newborns very well. So um, let me explain what I mean by that. We have, through the a tremendous work of country governments, um, health advocates, community health workers, global development partners managed to raise facility delivery rates uh, tremendously in many countries. In fact, it was a, a, a marker of progress for the Millennium Development Goals. Um, and we have now persuaded women in most countries to deliver in health facilities. What you see on this slide is uh, a number of countries that have achieved near universal facility delivery coverage, meaning the vast majority of women, almost 100%, are in health facilities delivering their babies. The countries are organized here by income level with lower income countries, um, a low middle income and upper middle income countries on the right. But the main point I wanna uh, show here is that uh, despite having achieved near universal uh, coverage of facility delivery, the rates of maternal mortality the rates of maternal mortality in those countries vary tremendously. In other words, one facility delivery is not equivalent to another facility delivery. And all of the rates, except for a couple of countries, Tajikistan I see is online, um, which is actually below the SDG target, but in the vast majority of countries, these rates are uh, unconscionably high. Uh, let's look at newborn survival. Same picture. We all know, those of you on this call know very well that uh, newborn deaths can be largely averted through excellent intrapartum uh, and postpartum care and, and antepartum as well. Margaret, and yet, yes. Speaking. I really apologize. I think um, you're going a bit fast for the interp interpreter. For the interpreter? Sure. Thank you so much. Thank Appreciate you, Pascal. It. Yes, give me that, uh, that message, please. Um, so um, here, uh, what I'm showing is that, again, in countries with 90% facility delivery coverage, we still have exceedingly high rates, sometimes twice the SDG target of newborn mortality, again, showing that facilities are not doing the job uh, that they are promising to women and populations. When we did an analysis of what is contributing to excess mortality in the maternal and newborn um, area, we found that already today, poor quality of care is a larger contributor than non-utilization of care. And let me just pause on this point. All of our efforts in global health, I would, I would uh, uh, propose, or certainly the vast majority, have been to promote utilization. And we've done this uh, decently well. Many countries still have challenges in utilization. And yet already today, uh, it is women who are coming to clinics who are not surviving or their newborn is not surviving. Um, and so you can see here that, that, that quality is a, is a binding constraint to further reduction in, uh, in newborn and maternal mortality. So let's zoom in on the global picture. Uh, we uh, can see very clearly that the bulk of excess of maternal and newborn deaths come from Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, uh, some in East Asia and the Pacific. So these are the two regions that contribute the majority of global newborn deaths. In our analysis, therefore, we really zoomed in on these regions to understand what is happening there. What is the care model that is in place there in these regions? 
it is not a factor of lack of facilities that seems to be driving this excess mortality in South Asia and Africa. I just want to show you a few slides that tremendous, tr there's been a tremendous building boom in health facilities in many countries. Uh, this is just some data from Kenya uh, showing the tremendous growth in health facilities throughout the country. Uh, since uh, since the early 2000s. And this has been echoed in many, many countries. Um, when we looked ourselves at geocoded data in even the very poorest countries, Haiti and Ethiopia, for example, you still see an extensive facility network. Um, so we do not lack buildings. We do not lack rooms um, to welcome women uh, into. So I think the question is not, are there enough facilities, but rather, what are the facilities doing for women and, uh, and newborns? And here we are looking at uh, data from the demographic and health surveys uh, to understand where women are choosing, which types of facilities are they delivering in? And I just wanna focus um, your attention on, on the huge, again, pro progress in Sub-Saharan Africa in reducing, in reducing home delivery, which has gone down uh, over the last decade uh, or decade and a half. And similarly, in India, which uh, is a huge contributor to excess mortality, we have had a huge drop in home deliveries. That's the red bar. Uh, what we further see, however, in this analysis is that the, the, uh, the place that women go when they're not delivering at home in many cases is what is in this light blue bar, which is a clinic, a primary care clinic. And here, let me define some terms. For the rest of this presentation, I will be talking about clinics versus hospitals. And what I mean by that is facilities without any advanced uh, care, such as cesarean section or newborn intensive care, that will be clinics versus facilities with those services, um, uh, that is hospitals. And so what we see is about one in three babies in the highest mortality regions right now uh, are being born in primary care clinics. And this is at odds with all the patterns of delivery care in high income countries. I show you here the United States, but I could also show you the UK, Australia, I could show you Mexico, I could show you low, high middle income countries where we would not think of delivering women outside of facilities uh, with, uh, with advanced services, including cesarean section. So just to take a step back, highest mortality regions have the highest proportion of women delivering in primary care facilities and at home. All right. Oh, pardon me. And I think you have been familiar with some of the evidence around facility delivery and newborn mortality. And these are um, data from the India uh, uh, Demographic and Health Survey, the National Family Health uh, Survey. Uh, each dot on this slide is a district in India in which we have looked at the proportion of deliveries that are inside facilities on the x-axis and newborn mortality on the y-axis. So you see that as facility delivery increases, newborn mortality falls, which is everything that we've been taught to uh, learn, to, to understand. But we dug a little deeper and we looked at districts that have expanded their deliveries through hospitals versus through non-hospitals. And here you see a very different picture. What you can see is that as hospital deliveries rise, mortality of newborns falls uh, quite dramatically. Where districts have instead chosen to expand delivery services through non-hospitals, you can see this, this actually increased mortality. At best, depending on which model we look at, you can see a flat line or similar mortality to home, uh, to home births. So uh, this slide title is System Models Matter. A facility is not a facility. They're not the same. And we can try to dig into this and understand why. Why is this? Uh, and I think this slide really makes the case uh, for why we can expect to see um, a, a difference in survival by level of facility. Uh, here, what you can see is uh, we looked at facilities that perform delivery, that have different delivery volumes, are, are, are busier or less busy. These are annual delivery volumes in data from five countries uh, from service provision assessments. And what we can see is that when you create a basic index of quality, what do those facilities have in them? What do providers do in them? Um, what you can see is that uh, the, the busier the facility, the better the quality. But what you can further see is the facilities in red are all hospitals and the facilities in blue are all primary care clinics. 
And so this slide may explain that at any level of volume, primary care clinics suffer from a lack of equipment, trained staff, protocols, and practices that would promote safe delivery. Despite all of the best efforts of the many people on this call and, and many, many, many um, midwives and, and nurses, it is very, very difficult to ensure a minimum level of quality in the primary care um, system. So what do we mean by quality? I've used that term now a number of times. And I want to propose that we, there are three elements of quality that um, uh, any facility delivering a woman, and frankly, any facility needs to have. It needs to have competent providers who can make an accurate diagnosis and manage correctly. It needs to have system competence, uh, which is, uh, has to do with continuity of care and safety and integration it's beyond the single provider. There needs to be a system of response to an emergency. And lastly, it of course has to provide respectful care and good customer service. So how have we tackled these quality gaps historically? Um, we have done a number of things uh, that I will uh, argue have been in, uh, ineffective. Uh, one of those things is to improve those primary care facilities. I think many of you on the call and certainly many people in the past have, uh, would agree that those primary care facilities could do a better job for uh, delivering women. Um, secondly, we've been thinking about prenatal risk assessment and stratification. Perhaps we could send low risk women to primary care facilities and high risk women to hospitals. Third has been the answer that actually what, what can happen is primary care facilities can refer women who, de who, who develop uh, complications during birth. And then the last idea I'm going to come back to is the point of today's discussion is to redesign health systems. But first, let me briefly go through the other solutions and explain why I don't think they're going to succeed. They haven't succeeded. So let's start with improving primary care facilities. It is our instinct when we see poor quality care for delivery to do more for that primary care facility, to put one more midwife in, one more algorithm in, uh, one more mast garment in uh, to make that facility better. And I would argue that is misplaced. And the reason that is misplaced is because uh, ultimately a maternal or newborn emergency is a health system catastrophe, which takes a whole system to respond to. And how do we know this? Well, we know this from clinical practice. Those of us who have dealt with uh, postpartum hemorrhage or an asphyxiated newborn know that it takes a team and a system to save that life. And this was really demonstrated in a, in a landmark study, the Better Birth Study in India, which did everything that we know how to do to improve quality in primary care facilities through coaching, through measurement, through feedback of data to providers through uh, providing basic supplies and equipment and making sure everything is there. But I wanna emphasize once again, the environment in which this study was done was primary care facilities in India. These facilities did not have the capacity for cesarean section. They had minimal capacity for newborn, newborn advanced care. And what they found is after a year of effort and a massive, um, uh, uh, massive follow-up of women into the community afterward, there was absolutely no difference in the outcome of maternal or perinatal adverse outcomes, which included maternal mortality, newborn mortality, and maternal and newborn mor morbidity. There was a complete zero. This was a very hard null result from this study. In short, primary care improvement did not work to save lives in this study. And in fact, many of the women and newborns that died, died in transfer to a, a definitive care. So improving delivery care is, is actually been conclusively shown to be impossible without the backup system of, uh, of cesarean section and, um, and advanced newborn care on site. Well, what if we could tell women, uh, tell women apart, the women who are going to develop complications uh, and the ones who aren't and, uh, and, and uh, target uh, their care to different facilities? Here's the problem with this. Even in the United States where we have all sorts of diagnostic capacities, uh, when we screen all women we, and, and use very restrictive criteria, we find that about only 40% of women, so a minority of women are judged to have no risk at all. All right, so that's the first point. That should suggest that 60% of women have some risk, so they should already be in hospital. But furthermore, of those 40% or 38% of women who were judged to be low risk, almost one in three of them developed unexpected, unexpected complications. So in other words, we're really bad at being able to risk stratify. We can see the same data in other countries. There's a study in South Africa that conclusively showed that the vast majority of newborn deaths were among babies 
and moms who were judged to be low risk to begin with. There was nothing suggesting this was a complicated pregnancy. In other words, we do not know which woman is going to develop complication uh, and any woman can. Okay, so the next solution that's been proposed is, well, if uh, women do develop a complication, perhaps they be, can be transferred during an emergency. And here, I just wanna remind you, and I think you know this better than I do, um, but you know, the countries that I have worked with for a decade or longer, I think uh, clearly demonstrate these numbers uh, in practice which is that when you look at primary care facilities, and this is data from 10 low and middle income countries, full, only 14% of them have a functional ambulance with fuel and only half have a, uh, have a facility phone or shortwave radio. Uh, referral is extremely problematic. In fact, I often say that referral is a figment of our imagination. It's just not there when women need it. Um, and even if referral were widely available, it goes against clinical best practice to take a woman who is bleeding or seizing and put her in an ambulance and try to save her life en route. We should never be in a position where, uh, where women are, um, are on the backs of cars uh, and uh, having a life-threatening emergency. And so the, the, the conclusion of all of these efforts really and the example from high and high and, and middle income countries is that we really have to reconfigure health systems, re, uh, rethink where women deliver in order to be able to save lives on a reliable basis. And so what do we mean by service delivery redesign? Service delivery redesign is simply about right place care. It is not a demotion of primary care. Primary care is completely critical in providing coordinated continuous care to low acuity conditions. In fact, primary care is excellent for antenatal and postnatal care, and I'll come back to that. However, conditions that can develop a life-threatening complication that needs treatment within minutes need to be inside a facility or right next to a facility that can provide definitive care, not temporizing care, not just a little bit of oxygen, but definitive care to cure that condition. And why? It's because as we discussed, complications arise unexpectedly, referral does not work. Um, we need a rapid response and often you need surgery and it is inconceivable, it's infeasible to put surgical uh, services and a large team in every single primary care facility. So what would, what would service design look like for the woman, for the family? Um, again, critical to the service delivery redesign are health centers and clinics, these primary care clinics that should be doing a much better job than they are today at providing high quality antenatal care. There are major quality gaps in antenatal care that can also promote maternal survival. For example, twins and breach presentations are often missed in antenatal care. Basic preventive measures are not provided. So there's a lot of work to be done in health centers and clinics to improve care. However, however, when that woman nears the time of delivery, she would be referred to the nearest uh, hospital or health center with surgical facilities. And we'll come back to the care models. And upon uh, safe uh, delivery, she would be discharged and discharged back to the care of the health center or primary care clinic, who would hopefully even be able to follow up in the community to make sure that newborn is doing well and that mom is doing well. So it's an integrated model that we're proposing. Uh, it is not simply just centralization into hospitals. Hospitals will have a defined but limited role in this continuum of care. So the next question that we're often asked is, well, that's wonderful, but is it even feasible? How many hospitals are there and could they possibly uh, be reached by women? Um, and here we have some very uh, uh, hopeful data. Um, I just want to show you um, uh, the story of Kenya, and we've done a lot of work in Kenya, so I keep coming back to Kenya, but uh, this uh, type of analysis is available for a number of countries. Today, uh, we mapped all the delivery facilities that are available in Kenya, and what we found is that uh, two-hour access is available to about 92% of women. Well, what I mean by two-hour access is women can reach the facility within two hours. The vast majority can actually reach it much faster but at the outside maximum, um, two hour access is available to 92% of women. Um, the uh, future scenario in which let's say only hospitals were permitted to do deliveries would reduce access from 92% to 90% because hospitals are actually quite well located along main roads and throughout the country. What I wanna draw your attention to is look at the average quality index, just using a very basic index of quality 
This would raise the quality of the average delivery facility from 0.42 to 0.7 um, in just that one move. So access is not unduly compromised. Of course, this has to be a local analysis because up here, access might become quite difficult. And we'll come back to that. I also want to remind us that people and populations and health systems um, are, are not static. Um, this, these data show the degree of urbanization that is happening in all of our countries and that in future urbanization will further reduce distance to care because women are going to be near cities and towns which have hospitals. Another question I'm often asked is, will women travel to hospitals? Would they, why would they go if they have a facility nearby? Well, we have done, and, and other researchers, and I see some uh, friends from Ifakara Health Institute on this call, I'm delighted to see them, and, and their collaborators in these studies, showing that actually women bypass local dispensaries all the time to get to hospital without any incentives, without any education, without any uh, uh, other motivation, uh, four in 10 women today bypassed on their own accord a nearby dispensary that does delivery and travel to hospital. Furthermore, in these data, we found that women who delivered in hospitals reported better experience on a number of fronts. There's some natural experiments that are worth us looking at. And I'm looking at data here again uh, from, from Tanzania which shows volumes of delivery in health centers before and after the introduction of cesarean section. And you can see that the red bars uh, show in general a very a substantial rise in utilization of those facilities. Women get it. When you provide advanced services, women know they have a higher chance of survival and they will go. So this is about redesigning the system as a whole in an intentional way that is context specific and user centered. We've talked about hospitals, they have to be improved. I do not want anyone on this call to walk away with the idea that tomorrow we can just tell women to go to hospital. Hospitals require that sort of sustained quality improvement and investment to be able to save lives. We still see excess mortality, even in hospitals, they are not ready for prime time in many cases. I will say improving 100 hospitals is much easier and, and more efficient than improving 10,000 clinics. So we have that advantage. The second piece is boosting primary care. As we already discussed, uh, antenatal care, postnatal care, well newborn care, sick newborn care should all be coordinated through primary care. And it is critical for them to be able to, uh, to refer patients uh, who develop complications in pregnancy early. Enabling access is obviously going to be critical. So even though I stated that uh, we don't lose access overall, of course, for an average woman that may, delivering in a hospital may require a longer trip. And so how do we make sure that in an effort to save more lives, we are not leaving behind very vulnerable people who are living farthest away? So what are the vouchers, ambulances, public-private partnerships that we could bring to bear all of the energy that has been developed through experimentation uh, over the last few decades to be, to be really targeted to this issue. Uh, lastly, we need to build demand among communities. While many women get it and would want their baby to survive, women are concerned. And I'm gonna show you some of the concerns that have arisen in our work in Kenya um, about overcrowding and, and disrespect and, and getting to facilities, making sure they don't uh, go broke paying for transport. So building demand and, and educating communities is part of it. All of this needs to happen before the policy change. So I just wanna emphasize this is not an overnight uh, plan. All right, so let me get quite specific about a very specific setting because you've heard me talk in theory and in large generalities. Um, so here we have uh, an example from Kenya, Kakamega County is one of the largest counties in the country. It has 2 million people in it and about 72,000 deliveries per, uh, per year. It has also high maternal and newborn mortality. Um, these dots are the facilities, again, showing an extensive facility network. And you can see where we went to collect data um, through the colored dots. Um, so the current model of care in Kakamega is that uh, one in three women deliver in what in Kenya are level two and three facilities, which are in our in our uh, parlance primary care facilities. 37% deliver at home and about 36% deliver in hospital. So as I look at this pie chart, 
I'm basically saying only 36% of women really have a strong chance of survival um, if something were to happen. Now let's dig a little further. In Kakamega, 86% of facility deliveries are in extremely low volume clinics. These are primary care clinics that do fewer than 30 deliveries a month. So in any country, they will be judged as very, very um, low volume. These clinics, again, do not have C-section. They have very few staff and they have uh, 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 quite low skills, which I'll show you in a minute. Uh, when we asked providers in level two, three, and four facilities about, we actually gave an obstetric knowledge test, and we also uh, gave questions on whether you have managed these key complications that cause the majority of deaths. What you can see is that, uh, not surprisingly, providers in lower level clinics have not seen these complications in the past year, whereas providers in um, hospitals have seen them. And this is critical for being able to manage them properly. And even when you ask them about their confidence levels, you can see the confidence being lower in uh, primary care facilities. And I just want to point out that there is a real human cost here too, um, on, in, the, in terms of the stress on health workers working in primary care who are expected to manage life-threatening complications essentially by themselves with no backup. Uh, we talk about uh, uh, burnout, we talk about worker stress, we talk about attrition, and yet we don't link it to the unreasonable demands we make on some of the health workers in primary care clinics. So then what could Kakamega do differently? Uh, we show here the uh, as surgical centers, which are the uh, facilities that, um, that are hospitals or could become delivery hubs, uh, and show that actually uh, they are well distributed throughout the county. And when we did the distance analysis in Kakamega, we found that 92% of women um, uh, and not, uh, live within one hour of the current surgical facilities, and that there are a number of facilities that are about to be upgraded to surgical facilities. And when you add those in, 99% of women live within a one hour distance. We talked to health workers as well to try to understand their perspectives and whether they think shifting deliveries to hospital makes sense. And what you can see here is that it actually is quite consistent between the facility levels, both hospital and clinic workers agree, strongly agree that, uh, that we should be looking at a different uh, care model. We also conducted focus groups in Kakamega. And Kakamega, I can say more about it in, in our discussion later. This is, a, this is a county that was chosen by the, uh, by the Council of Governors. This is not our choice. This is a governor who wanted to make a change in his county. Uh, this is a governor who sees the, um, the, both the efficiency arguments and the medical and clinical futility of continuing to persist with the current model. And uh, this is why we exerted um, this energy to, and, and working very closely with the Ministry of Health uh, there to, to collect these data and to understand the situation better. But what you can see here is that people want facility delivery. There is definitely a, a perception of benefit. And that uh, the first thing they, um, uh, they mentioned when we spoke about uh, delivering everyone in hospitals or near hospitals is that you will not be referred to another facility if the problem is there. There will not be a delay in the life-saving care. Mm -hmm. However, people raise the issue of how are we going to get there? What's it going to cost us? Um, and I think that's a really important uh, point. They also uh, uh, raise the issues that I think all of us are now increasingly aware of, which is about respectful care and avoiding overcrowding. And I put these as system challenges. These are not insolvable, but they are absolutely uh, essential to get right in service delivery redesign. So even if we can get women to go there though, we still have challenges in knowledge. And I just wanna show you some knowledge scores. This, these are uh, test scores on a 60 item maternal newborn knowledge test among uh, health providers in clinics and doctors in level uh, uh, five facilities, hospitals, showing there's still gaps in knowledge even at the hospital level, which returns me to my point that hospitals need improvement as well and need devoted uh, resources for that. So how do we do redesign? Um, what, how do, what's the first step for redesign? I would say that it comes in three phases. Uh, first, I think it's about engaging um, the political leaders and the medical and clinical leaders of any one jurisdiction to understand their interest and motivation for structural reform. In Kakamega, one of the biggest motivators for the governor, besides leaving a legacy of lower maternal and newborn mortality, which he clearly wanted to do, 
was the incredible inefficiency he saw from the data in which facilities uh, all throughout the county are equipped to provide delivery services and almost nobody comes. So for him as an accountant, this was an incredible inefficiency. And I think that's an important motivator for many. Um, so we need to engage leaders in this discussion. This is not a technical discussion. It's a political discussion first and foremost. We then need to analyze in the local setting, facility distribution, coverage, quality, management practices, utilization patterns, road networks, and so on, as we did in Kakamega. Once you have this diagnosis, then you can work with the, um, with the local leaders to design, implement, evaluate, and scale. And I just wanna talk about the importance of collecting data, not just on health and outcomes, which is critical, but also on people's confidence on costs, on the unintended consequences across the whole health system. We think there are benefits to this, uh, in this model to other conditions, including, for example, uh, accident victims who will have uh, uh, you know, more efficient um, uh, surgical services in hospitals, decongested primary care clinics, happier health workers uh, who are gonna be working in, more of them working in teams in hospitals and so on. So what are the models going to look like in reality? There isn't just one model. I am not only talking about building more wards and hospitals, although in some places that's entirely viable. You all know that there are many HIV wards that are sit sitting empty thanks to the eff 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 efficacy of antiretroviral medication. Um, can those wards be converted to low risk or, or, or normal maternity wards in hospitals? Perhaps in some that will work. Um, what about adjacent birthing wards that can be built next to hospitals? And finally, in some towns, we see the situation of a district hospital that is overrun and many health centers very close by within one or two kilometers that are largely empty may have maternity wards. Can they be converted to maternity centers of excellence with immediate access to the OR or newborn resuscitation within minutes, not hours, not in a different town, but within minutes. And all of these models can be run by midwives. This is not some push to medicalize childbirth and have doctors be in charge. We know that's infeasible and nor is it best practice. Midwives can be in charge of many of these models, but the difference is that they have immediate backup. They have immediate support from physicians and surgeons. And for transport, there are lots of things and I'm going to go very quickly here because I want to uh, give enough time for discussion. But there are lots of models being developed, uh, ride sharing, uh, taxis. Let's remember when women have to reach a hospital early in labor, she's not, uh, she's not an emergency patient, she's not bleeding. She may be having some early labor pains and there are lots of ways to move women like that um, uh, to the hospital. It's critical that in any service delivery redesign effort, we think about any negative unintended consequences. I've already mentioned some of these. So overcrowding is always what comes up. How do we plan for that? We can, do, we can obviously do some planning based on expected pregnancies and expected deliveries and look at adjacent facilities uh, and, and through plans, make sure that no, that redesign does not leave women delivering on the floor. That is completely contrary to the model. We want to avoid over-medicalization. I've already mentioned this. We want to avoid excess C-sections. I think we do that through midwifery-led care, through close supervision and quality reviews, through a real focus on respectful care. Another issue, of course, is inequities in access. We've talked about some of this already. In addition to the things that I think are quite instinctive to us, thinking about subsidies or vouchers, let's not forget that building targeted roads or paving some, some roads in some places in a very strategic way to help these three villages get to the hospital is a very viable policy option. And at the World Bank, where you work across sectors, there's no reason why we couldn't make a case for maternity, uh, strategic maternity roads, for example. And then there will be other consequences that we have to look into. And, and in order to be able to track them, we need to be um, building learning systems into evaluations and adjusting these models as they go, including giving people the opportunity to give feedback. Um, again, we are talking about a system-wide redesign that will promote um, access to life-saving care, concentrate our efforts, improvement efforts in fewer facilities, provide care teams, which will optimize human resources with midwives being able to work together, which we know produces happier health workers and overall a more efficient health system. And that is my last slide. As you can see, this is a blank slide because I am really eager for this discussion and really delighted to hear from, from the remaining panelists and all of you. Thank you.
Margaret, thank you so much. Um, always more to learn on this subject. Really, really appreciate it. So I've been monitoring the chat box to see if there are any quick clarifying questions before we go to the panel. Um, there are many really interesting but complex questions and only two really clarifying ones. The first is um, when was the Kenya study done and was it pre-COVID or does it include data collection during COVID times? <clears throat> yeah, so this was about a year and a half ago, so pre-COVID. Right. And then the other is, does the mapping of clinics and hospitals in Kenya cover the public and the private sector? It does. It does. And just real quick, if you have any other clarifying questions that'll help with um, further discussion, drop them in the text. And um, while you're doing that, uh, let me set up the panel. So <laughs> service delivery redesign is not an easy topic to discuss or to understand, and there's still so much work to be done on it. Um, we are interested in having that conversation and using this session as an opportunity to advance learning and move forward. We're excited to have four panelists raise some of the um, sort of considerations, perhaps concerns of uh, implementing redesign in their particular settings. So let me start um, if I know I saw Dr. Batarai here. Um, Yes, I do. Okay, great. So our panel um, includes uh, uh, Dr. Manav Batarai, who's a senior health specialist with the World Bank. Um, Mr. Batula Amit Nagaraj, who's a senior operations officer at the bank. Uh, we also have uh, Supriya Madhavan, who is um, a senior health specialist with GFF and the World Bank, who will be uh, and also uh, working in DRC. So she'll help us understand um, the DRC perspective and uh, uh, Petra Vergier, who is the GFF lead for knowledge and learning in RBF. Um, so, but let's start with, with Manav. Manav, over to you, thank you. Okay, thanks Sanam and thanks Margaret. Um, I like the presentation as well as the concept, which uh, I got to know about it, uh, last week uh, and uh, i'm very thankful for the team to for having me here to speak some of my thoughts uh, in terms of how service delivery redesign could help these uh, I help, especially i'm working in south asia region how it can help um, let me uh, let, let me uh, give one example that uh, i'm from nepal and uh, once I was visiting a health facility, which was at, a, at, at the top of a hill, and it was a birthing center also. It was a birthing center, and uh, it uh, was a birthing center for normal delivery, right? And to go up that hill, it takes, if you walk, I think it will take uh, 45 minutes, but there was a gravel road, which I think we reached there within 10 minutes or so. And from the main road, there was a hospital at half an hour distance, right? And uh, well equipped hospital, uh, which can uh, which can handle complications as well. So I was also questioning what was the rationale of having this health facility at the top of a hill, which uh, and, and and when there was a hospital in a half hour half an hour distance if you could get a vehicle from your house to reach the hospital right so that uh, that that's one example and um, in nepal uh, for, for example where i just uh, work and I'm, I'm presently based in pakistan right now but i can cite for example from nepal birthing centers i, I think grew like mushrooms uh, normal birthing centers, and especially at the lower health facilities, which were supposed to handle uh, normal delivery, right? But then when there were complications, as we could see from the example, I mean, the, I mean, the evidence that uh, was presented, I mean, those were the issues. Those were the issues in terms of quality and whether they were handling complications as well or not, what the referral time and, you know, the, the Decision making, instant decision making, whether it should, the, the mother should be referred as immediately as possible or wait until I mean, the delivery happens and then when there's a 
uh, no way out in the refer and then the model uh, lands into some kind of morbidity or I mean, it, the mother is unlucky, maybe mortality as well. So, I mean, these are the issues that we've been facing in the region, and I'm sure Pakistan is also no different right now. Okay, the only thing that uh, uh, would, I mean, the, oh, I wouldn't say the only thing, the main thing that would matter in terms of decision or creating demand, I would say, I, I could hear from Margaret as well, women are empowered. If they know that this is good, they'll just do it, right? And if the only thing that is important here if from the service delivery design point of view, uh, one of the main things I would say is the connectivity and access, right? The connectivity and access, that's important, right? But coming from South Asia region and from many developing countries, we, we see that, I mean, most uh, of us, most of the health facilities which are there is in the rural setting and the connectivity is very uh, not right. And then easy access to hospital is very bad. Even access to physical access to the health clinics is very bad, right? So one thing that's important is to improve the connectivity, right? Uh, besides improvement in the hospitals and all that. The other thing that I think uh, to implement the service delivery redesign is uh, how do we take care of the cultural preferences, right? Cultural preferences, because people do prefer to deliver at home uh, if, if there is no physical access to a hospital very close by, right? So even if there is a connectivity, which let's say two hours of drive, people have cultural preferences that they want to deliver at home and it's not uh, new to many rural areas in South Asia, right? Uh, the other issue that I I think that that has to be taken care of is what we have been do, doing for the last decades is we have generated a lot of community health workers, like in Pakistan also we have lady health workers and midwives, right? Who are trained midwives who are trained as skilled birth attendant. Um, they are supposed to handle mild complications, whether they're doing it right or wrong, that's a, a question mark, right? But then when we uh, work on the service delivery redesign, we have to think about how to uh, redesign their work program, right? And how, how where do we shift them from where, ex where, where they are right now and how do we take them to, let's say, a hospital, right? The other issue that I see here is the HR mismatch, right? The HR mismatch in terms of whether we have the right kind of um, Doc, I, I educate doctors or anesthesiologists or nurses to handle this, right? Because there will definitely be a workload in the hospitals uh, when we re redesign this, uh, basically taking care of the maternal and newborn care. Right? There will be addition burden and to the hospitals, and if we do not have an adequate capacity, that that can be an issue. And also, in when we are in the public health uh, public health facilities, we know that incentive is an issue. Salary is an issue, right? And without any adequate incentive, I think the additional burden might be a problematic. The issue that uh, uh, needs to be tackled while implementing this is the, uh, the infrastructure, right? Infrastructure uh, has to be upgraded, like uh, Margaret said, and they have to be, they, these need to be kind of uh, good. Even on the private sector side, uh, some kind of regulation has to happen because we need to deliver and we, private sector partnership is also necessary, but their quality also needs to be improved, right? And to offset the high, uh, to offset the out-of-pocket expenditures, if government is not financing in its entirety, there should be some sort of insurance to cover, like vouchers, cash vouchers and all that, that has to also kick in together. Um, in Pakistan, uh, I, I would say, I mean, right now the government financing is just $14 to $15 per capita, right? And the total end expenditure is right now is $1.45 per capita. So there is already a low fiscal space. Uh, how we can uh, integrate this service delivery redesign into uh, the current system, I think that has to be thought through in terms of expanding fiscal space as well. I think they, they would, that would require some kind of additional uh, fund. And there are, again, I, I, I think overall system challenges also, which uh, I think South Asia or any development country is, uh, is facing the poor uh, uh, financial management. And also there are issues with, related to data, information management, which is, I think, quite essential when we look at this service data redesign also. Um, 
we are we, i think with the stc we all are focusing on primary health care approach we are trying to re energize that so that uh, we want to improve the efficiency of uh, resource spending um, and i think every country is um, is trying to refocus uh, in primary health care uh, and also pakistan is not new they have recently uh, developed the basic essential health care package under uhc and and they want to deliver this in a devolved contest um, on a primary health care model, right? Um, I see when I, uh, read, I went through the presentation as well as the document that I had, uh, we are not, I think, looking at the different elements of the STR, we are not getting away from the primary health care. That is what I believe, because there is a continuum of care, right? So we should also say that we are not getting away with the primary health care office. We are trying to integrate, integrate this STR approach in the overall primary health care model because it's it's talking about the quality delivery at the hospitals and the referral mechanism, which is like uh, from the community, I would say, from the community to the hospital when, when it comes to delivery. And uh, I, I think that's important in terms of delivering the message. Uh, otherwise, uh, what we see is like we are trying to build hospitals and then uh, in already a resource constraint setting, um, that might be a no-no. So I, I, I just wanted to stop here, uh, just to reflect on my thoughts uh, when I read about the concept. Over, thank, thank you, Manav, thank you so much. I'm just gonna move right on to our next uh, presenter. Petra, I see your face. Are you Are you ready to give us a few minutes of your thoughts, please? Of course, happy to. Um, and um, <clears throat> I've been asked to bring some of the challenges to the fore uh, with the idea of the uh, health service delivery redesign. I think um, um, there are lots of good reasons why redesign may be needed. Being a nurse myself, I know if I haven't done something very regularly, I lose my practice and I won't be so good in it or won't recognize the risks and the symptoms uh, that would uh, be needed uh, in cases of delivery or other uh, procedures. Um, I also recognize the need for the equipment uh, that needs to be there and, uh, and the conditions to provide the quality care. Um, what I wanna bring to the fore is some of the uh, challenges I've seen when we've had conversations about this in both Tanzania and Sierra Leone. Um, and, and I see Dr. Misemo is on the line, and I don't know if Dr. Smart is here from Sierra Leone. They might even be better placed to talk about this than me, but let me try and summarize a few points of what I've learned, and I hope that they and others can bring in uh, the challenges with them. One is, I think, the narrative that we use, um, because the focus on, on hospitals uh, versus uh, facilities is something that uh, uh, has politically there have been a, a very long narrative for politicians in many countries to bring health services closer to the people. Um, so changing that narrative and, and now saying people have to go to the hospital, which often it means in everyone's mind, very far away setting, uh, far away from everywhere, is a, real, uh, is a real hard sell and not something that I think is easy. So I think the question is, um, uh, how, what exactly is it that we're looking for? Is it really about the hospital level or is it about the conditions and the skills of the facilities, uh, et cetera? Um, now, not only is it just the, the political and the buy-in, I guess, that I'm talking about, it also has to do with transitions in both governments or in, in bank or teams that are engaged in these discussions that when there are changes, sometimes when there has been buy-in, the next uh, group that no longer buys in. So that also has challenges. Um, I heard Manaf mention the financial implications of the redesign and the costs of upgrading facilities. When we looked uh, in Sierra Leone for uh, uh, upgrading facilities to become like CMOC facilities as a first stage for facilities to, to ensure deliveries, the cost of upgrading are quite significant. Uh, and also the, taking into account the costs of um, patient transfer. And I heard Manaf mention that as well. Um, we see that uh, uh, women need to stay 
in the area of delivery for a longer period of time. They have concerns not only about the travel, but where are they going to stay? Uh, what about who's going to look after their children back home and the family? So these are all uh, concerns that I have heard. Um, on top of that, I know in the World Bank, it's not always so easy to do sort of things like infrastructure in a fast way. So these things are a lengthy process uh, to upgrade facilities in, in many settings uh, that are important to think about. Um, the other aspect is related to, um, I would say, the incentives to change. Uh, and that I think is another important one because staff in health facilities and primary care facilities, what is uh, their incentive to refer women to a higher level to deliver? Um, often there is a lot connected to that. There is uh, status, there may be some payments or income that they're earning. So just thinking that women are going to go to a higher level facility to deliver or will be referred, there's a lot of implications in that. So thinking through that incentive uh, aspect is very important. Um, so I don't want to take too much time because I see lots of people putting comments in the uh, box that are, I think, very important. But for me, I would say there are two things to really think about. One is the narrative. What is it really that we're asking and saying that we want to do? We want quality, skilled, experienced staff in facilities with the right aspects. There are financial advantages to that. We had the discussion in Sierra Leone, for example, that it will not be feasible for Sierra Leone to upgrade every primary healthcare facility to that quality level. So then you're going to have mediocre quality everywhere across. So it may make sense to invest more in some and make those better quality care that then is accessible to all. But it is important to have that, to really think about what is it that we're really after. Um, and I, I feel just saying people should deliver in the hospital is not necessarily um, helping us in, in overcoming that. And then the other aspect I think is about, is it an incremental change or is it a complete redesign tomorrow? And I think I heard you also allude to that, Margaret, but if we put like what's at the end game, it's sometimes hard to see how are we gonna get there? What are the steps in between? And in many countries, it will not be possible. I see this also being said uh, to be there uh, tomorrow. So what is a, realistic pathway to do the right thing and to to get quality care for all women and, and, and newborns. Thank you. Thank you, Petra. Um, really interesting sort of perspective on on, on the narrative and the, and the narrative that that will be most uh, effective. Amit, I haven't seen your name, but um, if you're with us, can you please unmute your microphone and give us a few minutes of your of your thoughts? Thanks, Anna. Here you go. You can see me now. Um, well, uh, quite an interesting discussion, and uh, and thanks, uh, Margaret, for wonderful presentation. Uh, I can't agree with you more. You know, uh, on on all the recommendations which you have provided. So so that very clearly says that we all know how. Uh, but uh, you know, sorry, we all know you know what has to be done. But probably we all are you know grappling with you know, uh, you know, at what time and how this has to be done. So, well, uh, so one point is pretty clear that uh, you know there is no major challenge related to access, but the challenges with the quality and you know utilization of the services. Um, and I'll I'll give you the you know a uh, few uh, examples and the uh, experience from the field. We have been like struggling a lot in terms of improving the quality of service, but uh, wish we had a very simple answer because improving the quality of care, uh, in, especially in the public uh, hospitals, it's it's not easy because it has like several determinants to it. Um, and if one has to you know list the issues, there are like plenty. And especially uh, with a country like India, which you know has a very you know strong federal system and health being a state subject, it again depends on state to state. Uh, Basing on the level of capacity they have and the financing they allocate, uh, determines that what kind of uh, outcomes you will, you know, achieve. And one can very clearly, um, you know, see that 
the health indicators in South are very different from, you know, the North. Uh, and again, within North, if you try to, you know, fly towards uh, the Northeastern states with a very difficult terrain, again, that indicators for the, you know, core town. Uh, few key challenges which I have seen, uh, though there are like solutions, but it is more purely from the implementation point of view, one has to uh, probably, you know, deliberate a little further. Uh, you talk about the incentive systems. Yes, it you know, you have that in India. You talk about uh, the referral uh, transportation, like emergency transportation, like ambulances, you have it. Probably, you know, one of the largest fleets to maybe, you know, one can always, you know, debate about the efficiency, but probably, you know, it is there in place. We do talk about the uh, delivery hubs in the form of referral units, and then you have NICUs, CMOCs, and so on. Um, but again, the biggest challenge has also been related to HR, which is now slowly becoming a universal challenge. Uh, you know, the shortage of doctors and even shortage of nurses in few part of the, you know, few regions and few parts of the country has been like one of the biggest challenge. Uh, and again, you know, talking about their skill sets and, and I, I really like the slide that you presented on, you know, what are the knowledge levels uh, the health worker has has been a bigger, one of the biggest challenge. So you can manage to build the infrastructure, uh, which is, you know, predominantly most of the countries are doing, but if you're unable to get the right kind of uh, skills uh, or right kind of, you know, equipment or maybe right kind of uh, referral mechanism in place, it's, it's again, you know, then uh, you're not optimally utilizing the existing resource. I, I do agree that, you know, the bigger hospitals are always <clears throat> better in terms of providing the quality of service. But again, the challenge uh, in, in few states in India has also been related to uh, congestion in the hospitals. Like uh, most of the district hospitals, uh, if you know, it's, it's predominantly a secondary care hospital are overcrowded and they're overcrowded to the extent that they cater to like 150, like it's like uh, bed occupancy is like 120 percent, 130 percent average, which is not good. Uh, which is not good because your human resource is structured in such a way that um, the local uh, systems are followed. So it's not necessary that your uh, patient and doctor ratio, or even like your doctors to nurses ratio, is you know have any kind of standards. So, so these are like, you know, uh, some really practical challenges when uh, which one has to really, you know, uh, uh, think about. And, and we do have solutions, whether we talk about, you know, having a um, task shifting, which allows our human resource in health to deliver more. But again, on the other side, you have certain policies, the unions of, you know, the medical staff, which does not allow this to happen. Um, the most important point here is also related to the private sector. Uh, you know, uh, whether we like it or not, uh, in in India at least, uh, I can in a great confidence say that private sector has a you know huge share. It's like more than fifty percent, uh, where they play a very active role not only in providing the larger health system uh, health services but also for the deliveries. Now, if we if we Try to look at uh, the the regulatory mechanism. Probably in the government hospitals, uh, in fact, uh, there are like several internal systems for quality assurance and so on. Uh, but what is the incentive for the you know private sector uh, to really you know follow uh, those accreditations? Um, probably you know it is more in terms of you know playing around uh, with the demand and supply side, and that is where you know the private sector is smart enough. So I I'm not saying that you know. Uh, uh, what the private sector is doing is wrong, but probably, you know, at the larger level, we need to look at some kind of regulatory mechanism, which can also, you know, make sure that the quality is taken care of. The last point here uh, from my side is, um, uh, in, in the context of India, I think probably it is important. We need to have more and more decentralized, you know, service delivery mechanism. I, I'm not sure if, you know, everyone can be taken to the hospital given the kind of, you know, the population spread we have. Uh, but what is important is, um, to actually have a very uh, concentrated or targeted intervention to improve these hubs, which are already there in place. There is a huge investment which has been put up by Government of India or several other donors. Uh, and probably, you know, by doing that, we will be able to, you know, make this function well. And on top of it, um, developing the referral uh, uh, linkage between these hospitals is something which is very important. So someone who, who can't handle a particular case 
need to give the heads up uh, and and to in order to do that one need to have a very clear communication of the co coordination mechanism so I'll, I'll stop here uh, and i hope you know these points are useful I mean, thank you so much. Um, I think the operational perspective is really important um, in, in thinking about the future of redesign. Supriya, can I hand the microphone to you, please, to give us some remarks, um, especially thinking of redesign from the perspective of DRC? Yeah, thanks, Sanam. And uh, thanks again to Margaret for a fantastic presentation. And uh, thanks for all the interest from the, from the audience. Um, so as Sanam said, I'm, I'm here mainly to represent sort of the DRC perspective. Uh, I'm on the task team of uh, one of the DRC's projects. So this, this topic can't be more relevant for a country like DRC. We, we have uh, historically very high rates of institutional delivery in DRC. Um, we, it's, we're guessing it's probably well over 85% right now. Um, so, so that's sort of the, the positive that we start with, that women are already uh, eager to go to facilities to deliver. But on the other hand, we also have one of the highest rates of maternal mortality in the world. We haven't measured in, in a few years, but it's in the 800. So clearly, uh, clearly it's not just about institutional delivery for us and, and uh, we have uh, really daunting quality of care issues. So, I mean, I'm, I'm just gonna stick to three short points because uh, we do wanna get to the discussion. Um, so one is just what's, what's very particular to DRC is that uh, it's an enormous landmass. So geographically, it's a huge country, uh, not densely populated at all. Uh, without good infrastructure at all in terms of road networks, in some cases, water networks. Um, so it, it is not, it is, it is not Kakamega County at all. Uh, you know, you would be hard pressed to find even one province that has any kind of a density of people within, you know, 90% of people within uh, a surgical facility. So, so that's a that's a really big uh, specific uh, a barrier to to thinking about um, taking on service delivery redesign in a context like DRC. I mean, what would you what would you recommend specifically here? Would we be thinking more about maternity waiting homes? Would you think about equipping uh, a greater number of hospitals um, given, given the size of, 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 the, of um, the geography? Um, so that's, that's a very specific question to a country like DRC. Um, secondly, I think it's really hard to wrap our heads around going to scale again in a country like DRC, but any country. I mean, Kakamega County is looks like it's it's one now on its way to becoming a successful example but uh again how do we how do we think about the costs involved uh in these extremely resource strapped countries um so the the you know the cash outlay in the beginning to get these hospitals equipped to to actually strengthen our primary healthcare services and drc we know that the content and quality of ANC isn't even up to up to up to snuff. So, how do we think about going to scale with an approach like this, even if we're not doing it overnight? Um, so, one of one of the issues I'd like to to bring out is that, especially for for partners like the bank, um, we it it would be really useful to start to look at uh, costing the efficiencies that we expect to gain in let's say over a decade's time. So, so really working on this approach of looking at how we shift costs across, across the system and how we actually have savings uh, at the end of a decade's time. So maybe this is something, this is a suggestion for the bank to take on or the GFF to take on, um, but it seems to be a really important um, ingredient of our discussions uh, to, to convince our, our clients uh, to, to engage in this. And finally, the, the third piece, everybody else has said it, but I, it's worth saying again that, um, you know, we, how do we stay true to this, uh, to this ethos of, of 
you know, being client focused and, and really paying attention to what women want in this case. I mean, I know it's, it's now sort of very much in vogue to say we should be, we should be patient focused, client focused and, and have human centered designs, but we have, we have real issues in DRC and in, uh, in lots of other countries about, you know, women, women having other children to look after, women having elders to look after, farm animals, crops, um, so, so real life uh, issues. So it's not just a matter of, of you know, uh, making sure we take the demand side into consideration. I mean, these are really practical, uh, practical, much more than bottlenecks. Um, so, so uh, I'm going to stop there with those three issues. Once again, uh, really excited to see this uh, conversation happening. Thank you. Thanks, Supriya. Thanks for speaking to a particularly uh, uh, difficult context for redesign and the realities of such a, a, a large, expansive country. Margaret, can I ask you to um, take a few minutes to respond? I know there was a lot in that panel, but um, uh, maybe five or 10 minutes of, of hearing some response from you, and then we'll turn to Q&A. Thank you. Wonderful. And I've been also tracking the amazing discussion going on on chat. Uh, so hopefully some of the comments can even address, because um, I think some of the points are actually coming back into themes, I would say. Um, so let me let me just uh, thank th those um, um, the panelists who've just spoken. I think you're raising real life issues. Um, before I get into some of the responses, um, I want to maybe just kind of focus us again on the North Star here. And that is that we should be solving for survival. All of the efforts uh, going forward need to be to maximize survival and not maximize other parts of the health system. So I would argue we've been maximizing access um, primarily. And I want us to shift uh, mentally, and it's a big leap to say, let's just take, take a fresh look and say, given all of the efforts to date, how would we reorganize ourselves if our focus, sole focus was the survival and the humane treatment of every laboring mother and every baby. And um, so with that, let me just come back to some of the very important points. Um, I wanna start maybe with the framing one because this one comes up a lot and that this model sounds like maybe we're going back to the 60s or 70s and it's all about hospitals and we're going to have hospitals become preeminent. I couldn't, this couldn't be farther from, from the intent. I wanted, maybe I should have started, I often start my talks by saying, I'm a primary care doctor, I'm a general practitioner. I have huge respect for the power of primary care in solving the majority of the issues that face populations, health issues. 70 or 80% of the problems out there should be solved by primary care doctors. However, I do not wanna be delivering women without backup, surgical backup, because that is the right care that they should be getting. So I think that as we think, of, and this has completely come up in the countries where we've been discussing this, this notion that primary health care is resurging, rightly so, um, is, is an important consideration here. And this, that's why this has to be framed very carefully. And I heard uh, from the panelists already the excellent suggestion of, we really need to be thinking about the system as a whole and the continuum of care. And maybe the way we talk about redesign, although I've presented you a lot of data on where women should deliver, I've also been careful to say that's just one part of their obstetric journey, of their childbearing journey, where they are seen first in antenatal care and very critically how their baby is treated postnatally is absolutely essential to survival, right? So we really need to think about the entire system as a whole. I think uh, primary care facilities do need uh, strengthening, do need reinforcement to do better on ANC and PNC. But let me just say one more thing, which we didn't get to in the presentation, but which your comments made me uh, recall, which is that today countries are pursuing universal health coverage. They are rethinking their whole model of care, the benefit package, the financing. Why not rethink service delivery? I think service delivery redesign could be an opportunity to say, what is the right type, what are the right services to be placed in primary care? If we can decongest clinics uh, by, by removing services, which they are not capable to do with high quality today, we make room potentially for the treatment of non-communicable diseases, simple and, and maybe basic mental health disorders, which could be dealt with and should be dealt with at that primary care level. So I think we should be positioning service delivery redesign, not just as an opportunity for mothers and newborns, 
but as an opportunity to rethink the system as a whole and what, op what options open up when facilities are not, primary care facilities are not just seen as MCH centers, right? But are seen as providers of the full range of primary care. Again, not overnight, but as benefit packages get put into place in countries, where can those services be provided? Well, actually, could we retrain clinical officers? Could we retrain nurses to be providing NCD care? So I do see service delivery redesign as a system-wide approach and also as an opportunity in the universal health coverage discussions. The second theme that I've, I've heard from a number of you, and actually a very important point in the chat, is, um, is about health workers and, and the difficulties, the shortages, and so on. So it is the World Bank's own work I think that raised the world's uh, attention to the fact that not every health worker is overburdened, that many health facilities are actually undersubscribed. And I think we have a narrative that every place has a deep shortage of health workers. Actually, in many cases, there's a shortage of patients in public clinics. And so there are, I think, I think we can all agree at minimum that there are inefficiencies in the system, right? So one of the ways that we've uh, thought about this in Kakamega and something that, again, was readily understood by the governor is that um, where there are birth uh, uh, focused health workers in lower level clinics, they could be either redeployed to deal with new conditions or some of them could be moved to the delivery hubs, to the advanced care centers um, so that they can work in teams. And we know team uh, work promotes happier providers and promotes better quality of care. So there are, again, and I think, um, I think maybe it was you, Petra, who raised this or, or others, just that there are um, shifts possible within the health workforce that do not require all new health workers. Um, I do agree, though, that, um, that physicians and, and, and midwives need upgrading. Uh, and I do completely agree with the colleague uh, from India that we're just not there in the, in the quality of care, even of the, of the best trained health workers. This is the space for pre-service education to be um, updated. I think there's lots of work to be done there, but also supervision, also outreach programs for the central hospitals. Uh, one of the uh, models that I've seen that I think is very exciting is having you know, residents, very highly trained uh, young doctors be posted in some of these delivery hubs throughout the country to gain better experience, but also to bring in that, that ambition for quality and that uh, new knowledge uh, set into the clinics. So I don't think the health workforce issues are a complete binding constraint. I think we have flexibilities there and, and the possibility to, to do better. Let me say a word about community health workers because that's another critique we get. What about all these community health workers that have been trained for so long to provide so much of this care? Uh, I don't think many people on this call would argue that they should be doing deliveries, but I think what we, uh, we could um, all consider is that community health workers, I think, can be uh, importantly redeployed to look after the very, very young, very, very fragile newborn in the community, for example. The mom will be discharged from hospital within two or six hours. We all know this, right? The risk does not end for that newborn. Community health workers are a fa fantastic resource to be able to link up with the mom and the primary care clinic as the coordinator of that care and jointly made responsible for that baby's survival. So I just think there's tons of opportunities for community health workers to do the job at which they are excellent, which is linking with families, spotting problems, referring up, up the chain, and not being counted on to do things that are beyond their capacities. Um, I just maybe will make one more point and then I'd love to hear from others, but just um, on this no notion of um, difficulty and costs, many of you in the chat have also raised just how difficult this is going to be um, and I, I often think about the fact that everything from here on in is going to be difficult, right? Um, mortality rates have fallen. To get the next tranche of improvement is gonna take a different level of effort than the last bit. And that means that the current model is also going to be more difficult. People are going to demand better quality at every clinic. And you, I think countries will need to decide how do we channel? What is the direction of travel of the system? You're right, Petra and, and others, this will not happen overnight. It is impossible in most places for this to happen overnight. Um, I, I would say that, um, that what, what is most essential is for us to have a common goal, that this is where we're moving toward, right? We are moving toward a system in which every woman and every baby can get life-saving care within half an hour or less and humane and patient-centered respect um, in that process. That's the goal. Now, 
If we have that goal, we can arrange our resources in the next step to meeting that goal and not some other goal. Like for example, providing delivery services everywhere, right? So I think if we shift our goal, that's the starting point. I think Supriya, for, for a country like, uh, like um, the DRC, you're completely right. And often I get the example of the Netherlands, which is one of the densest countries in the world. And we can say, we can have all kinds of models present in the Netherlands when there is a hospital within, you know, minutes away from every home delivery. So I think the DRC in the Netherlands are on opposite ends of the spectrum. But I would say that in places, um, I, I, would, I, would, I would split this out into uh, places in which uh, it is quite easy to imagine the access issues being solved, right? Peri-urban, urban, highly dense centers. So there's a typology that one can develop and I think the World Bank is well positioned to help countries do this. In that typology, what are the main barriers? They're not gonna be access, they're gonna be quality, they're going to be cost and others. Then there is another set of countries which are much more sparsely populated. What are the solutions there? And you mentioned maternity waiting homes and a number of participants mentioned those as well. And I think those are very viable options. When I delivered babies in Northern Canada, uh, you know, the nearest cesarean section was three hours away. And those women had to go early to, uh, to that town and, and live there for a little while keeping in mind all of the considerations that, that we have, it is going to be difficult um, uh, in those settings. I think some combination of, of waiting facilities and uh, upgraded surgical centers, which are strategically located. This is where the geolocation analysis is so critical. Strategically located along main roads that can serve the most people. I think that's a very viable option. That's what Tanzania has done in many places. It's upgraded health centers to provide a, a team C-sections and a, something like a newborn intensive care unit, according to local resources, that can function and then women do come. So I do think there are models available for, for all countries. They won't look the same, which is why we don't offer prescription for what the ultimate uh, um, system should look like. Rather, we offer the principles and the direction of travel. So let me stop here. Thank you, Margaret. Yeah, I think the issue of context is just so, so important and, um, I was actually hoping early on, there were quite a few questions from colleagues um, in the former Soviet countries and asking questions around how do these principles apply in places where you already have really high um, cesarean section rights, where everybody's already delivering in hospitals. So if you could just give a few reflections on that. Yeah, that's just such a great point. Um, so it again shows that hospitals as a building are not the panacea, right? Setting up the right model of care that will have the checks and balances to provide the floor of care, ec encourage excellence and prevent over medicalization is key. So I would say that in a, and again, I'm, this is a, in the spirit of brainstorming and I've had the pleasure of, of visiting Tajikistan several times. So I'm well aware that you've inherited a system which is extremely hospital based. And so the question there might not be, how do you get everybody to hospital? Cause that's where everybody already is. And I will point out by the way, maternal mortality is really quite low in Tajikistan compared to other countries. But rather there, the focus needs to be intensely on quality and the right level of care. And so the, the, the outcomes should be judged by uh, um, hospitals that can adhere to C-section guidelines and not over providing um, C-sections. Uh, supervision needs to be there to have providers account for why C-section rates might be high. And in a place where there are in a way too many hospitals, you might still designate maternity excellence centers, right, that are run by midwives with, with uh, or, or run by, let's say, general practitioners who are going to be less inclined to over intervene with support from the specialists. That would be another way. So kind of a de, uh, uh, de-escalation almost of care in, in some of those countries. And that's going to be a very special setting. Great. I think another question that's come up quite a lot um, is around data and monitoring. I mean, I think to your point, if we move forward either with the system as it is or potentially in a redesigned system and aren't monitoring um, women and outcomes, what's to say yeah. that we don't have women delivering at home that we don't even know about? Any thoughts on sort of what, what we should be thinking about in terms of monitoring our health system? Yeah, so let me say something that also is going to raise howls of this is just too difficult, but I'm gonna say it anyway. 
Right now, uh, the demographic and health information systems that are there in many countries, HMIS systems, are collecting a minimum of data, and that's critical. We're using, by the way, those HMIS systems in Kenya to track delivery volumes and where people go. So they're quite quite essential for any, well, for any health system management, first of all, but certainly for redesign. But I would say that where countries do need to be moving to is individual patient records that are electronic, even at the most minimal level. We know that the HIS2 has the capacity for individual patient tracking with some basic data on that person that will allow us to contact her to say, how did it go? How did this delivery go? Um, and I think I, it, you know, while we're building up those systems, those patient level data systems that will allow us to track outcomes and experience, in the meantime, it's quite feasible, quite easy, and co colleagues are doing it all over the world, to, to reach out to women, a sample of women who have delivered in different places and say, what could be improved? What could be done better? So that's on the experience and, and respect side, which are vital, vital for this to work but also of course on the outcomes um, front. And that, has, that is very much in the realm of vital registration systems that have to ascertain what happens to every newborn, no matter where they are born. And Sanam, if I can, I, I saw a question in the chat that's related about what happens to home deliveries. We have a hypothesis that if you can provide uh, definitive high level care, actually a number of women will leave the home to seek that care. We think based on work in Tanzania and, and a lot of work on uh, user preferences, that one of the reasons people go for antenatal care but refuse to return for birth care is because they've seen what that clinic has to offer and they are saying not good enough for me. So this is a hypothesis. It has not been tested in large studies. I think we have seen it tested in many countries where delivery rates already in facilities within a decade have gone up dramatically. We have seen it, uh, we have seen in Uganda where within one year, 30 percentage point increases in, in facility delivery are possible when hospitals were improved. So we see lots of signals that home, women who would have previously delivered in the home might come forward. Is it gonna solve that for every woman? Absolutely not. But I don't think we should assume right off the bat that those women are never gonna leave the home if you move to hospital. Yeah, I mean, people are making rational decisions often, you know, um, we just need to make sure that we're that women who don't have the means to actually do that on their own and bypass and get to the facility that they need to get to um, uh, couldn't do that. So I'm, I want to squeeze in one more question before we close up. There were a lot of questions around how to deal with countries with really high out of pocket payments. Um, what are the finances? Any sort of last last thoughts on that? Yeah. And this is a great question to end on because I think it, it really harkens to the fact that this is a societal set of decisions. This isn't just about the health system by itself. We've already talked about roads and now we're talking about financing and budget allocations. I saw a number of comments about, well, this is just going to be too expensive. Healthcare is expensive. Healthcare costs go up, we know, almost on a one-to-one -one basis with GDP increase. It's one of the most valued services. So we are going to have more fiscal space in, in countries going forward. It won't, again, happen overnight. But the question is, how do we deploy those resources? And in terms of out-of-pocket costs, I think we've seen a lot of experimentation and quite successful models. Uh, I'm thinking about India in particular uh, um, and, and uh, with RSBY and other, other models in which uh, private uh, uh, hospitals, for example, can be contracted in and held accountable for outcomes. Um, and women can access those uh, facilities for free to them and you, through the use of vouchers or subsidies. Um, I think those are, those are reasonable models. Again, universal health coverage right, is going to guarantee a basic package of services of which in every country that I'm aware of, birth is one. So how do we make sure that women who access the right level of care, the designated facility, the, the, the hospital or advanced care facility uh, can do that uh, um, you know, at the least possible cost? I think there are lots of things opening up and lots of experimentation that suggest in the meantime, vouchers and subsidies and other mechanisms may be necessary in some places. I don't think they're necessary for all women. I think women are already able to pay in some cases, but I am, I am uh, of the firm belief that this is not an innovation that should just be allowed to flow to the rich. And I think that is what will happen if we don't take good care to ensure that uh, the poorest have, um, have those subsidies and those um, supports to be able to reach that high quality care. Otherwise we will see a further uh, a stratification of, of outcomes. Absolutely, thank you, Margaret. Thank you so much for your presentation, for, um, for your thoughts on this subject, um, for uh, fielding some tough questions. 
Uh, thank you also to our panelists, really raised some of the core issues that I think many of us think about when we think about service delivery redesign. I am um, really grateful for everyone's questions and comments in the chat box and have been frantically trying to um, put them all in one place so that we can share them out with everyone and continue this conversation. Um, as I mentioned, we have a, a web page where we're collecting resources. That's already up um, with some of the sort of background materials. We'll be uh, posting Margaret's slides there, the recording. Um, I would love to see at some point an opportunity for us to have a space where we can continue to sort of ask questions and discuss through that web page. So all of that is um, th that is in the works. Uh, Pascal, I want to thank you and your team at the GFF um, for all of your hard work in getting this going. I see you've posted an evaluation form. We would be very grateful if you could um, uh, give us your thoughts on how this presentation went so we can improve in the future. And then finally, this is not the last um, chance that we'll have to talk about service delivery redesign. This is actually the first of a series of workshops that we'll be holding over the next couple of months. Um, the topics of those discussions will be based on the questions that you've raised and the comments that you've made. Um, they will be workshop style opportunities to dive more deeply, to think um, sort of actively about your specific context and how to improve the way that we uh, design and redesign our health systems for better outcomes. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate your time. Take care. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Merci à toutes et à tous. Merci. N'hésitez pas à utiliser le formulaire et à envoyer quelques Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Form before leaving. Thank you so much. Please click on the form before leaving. Au revoir. Merci. Merci de regarder le formulaire et de de répondre. Merci. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Merci. Thank you. Au Thank you. Bye. 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 Merci. Au revoir. 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 Merci. Thank you and bye. Merci de tout Bye everyone. Au revoir. Asante Donuts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Yes. Yes. yes, stay safe, everyone. Bye. Wear your masks. <laughs> Bye. Stop recording.